circle above has a center O. The length of arc ADC, the minor arc, is 5 pi, and x equals 100. What is the length of arc ABC? All right, so if we look at this, what we want to do is set up a ratio, right? So the first thing we know is that the angle x is going to be corresponding with that arc ADC. So our angle x, we can just write this on top, would be 100, right? And so it's corresponding to arc ADC, which has a length of 5 pi. And so now they want us to determine what is the length of arc ABC, right? This side right here. This side right here, right? So because we know that the circle is split up quite evenly, right? The degree value over here is going to correspond with that arc length of ABC. And so can we determine that angle? Well, we can't because we know there's 360 degrees in a circle. And so if angle X is 100 degrees, we're left with 260 degrees, right? So this will go on top. And so now we can actually pretty easily figure out what our um, length of arc ABC is by just finding this corresponding value, right? So to do this, we have to do some simplification, or we can just find the factor, actually, right? So from 100 to 260, that is a scale factor of 2.6x, or 2.6 times. And so we can assume that for the same thing on the denominator, to keep this ratio constant, we also have to multiply this by 2.6. And so here, we can just do 5 times 2.6 pi, and that's the same thing as multiplying 5 pi by 2.6. So 5 times 2.6, that will give us 13, right? And then we can just add the pi at the bottom, or next to it. So we get 13 pi as our final answer. So the answer here is B. All right, so the next problem says a circle in the xy plane has a center at those coordinates of negative 5, 2, and has a radius of 9. The equation of the circle is x squared plus y squared plus ax plus by plus c equals 0, where a, b, and c are constants. What is the value of c? All right, so the thing here is we've drawn out what we have, the standard form for a circle, right? And so what we have are these centered coordinates, and we know the centered coordinates correspond with h and k respectively in this equation. And we also know the radius, so we can just plug these numbers in. And so here we'll have x, and because we have a negative 5, and the standard form here is a negative, in reality h here, h is negative 5, right? So if you take a negative of a negative, that's in reality just positive. So x plus 5 here is going to be squared plus y minus k k here is just positive 2 squared equals the radius squared. The radius we know is 9, so 9 squared is 81. And so now what you'll realize is if we just uh, expand this out, right? We have two um, parts here that we can expand out. If we expand this out, it will become eerily similar to the form we have here because we're going to break it up into the x squared, the ax, the y squared, and the y parts. And so here we have x plus 5 squared, which is the same thing as just x squared plus 10x plus 25. Let me switch colors for the y minus 2 part. That is going to be plus y squared minus 4x plus positive 4 equals 81. And so what we're interested in seeing here is the c value, right? The c value is the constant, and it doesn't have the x or x squared in front of it. And so because of that, we can actually determine what it is because on this side you can see it's zero, but on our side here is value of 81. So what we need to do is subtract 81 on both sides. Boom, boom, boom. And then once we subtract 81 on both sides, we just want to combine like terms, right? We have a positive 25 here, a positive 4 here, and then a negative 81 here. So here we just have 29 minus 81. And 29 minus 81 will give us a value of negative 54. And therefore, we can determine 
that the value of C here is just going to be negative 52. So the first thing we want to do when we start off with any sort of English question is we have to actually read the question. That's right, skip the paragraph and go right to the question, which we have right here. So and it asks, which finding about the basin, if true, would most directly support a conclusion? And it'll usually have the word concluded in the passage, usually towards the end. So we found that right there. Cardenas and Lamb concluded that the wet and warm scenario is likely correct. Now, what is the wet and warm scenario? Now, on the SAT, you are not going to have any knowledge of any sort of science or social studies topics. You'll just need to be able to use English skills for the English section. So, the wet and warm scenario will be described in another part of the passage. Now, let's go back and read the passage and see, we could, see if we can figure out what the wet and warm scenario is. It looks like here we're talking about Mars which might have once had liquid water. And the wet and warm scenario represents a prolonged phase of warm, wet conditions. Now, which of these answer choices is going to best represent a climate with warm, wet conditions? Well, if it's short-lived, then we can probably outrule A, because we see here we have this word prolonged, which kind of conflicts with short-lived. So it's not A. Let's look at B. It is surrounded by channels that could have been formed either by running water or by flowing lava. Well, lava isn't really directly supporting our claim, so we can outrule B. Especially because of this idea of either, meaning that it's really not a very direct correlation between flowing water and flowing lava. C. It has features suggesting that it once held an ocean that underwent gradual sea level changes over an extended time. Now this one would make sense. Why? Because this prolonged thing is true. We can say prolonged is true. If there's an ocean, obviously we're going to have warm, wet conditions. Now let's take a look at D, just to make sure that we can outrule D. D talks about an asteroid or a comet impact. Nowhere in this passage is an asteroid or comet impact mentioned, so we can clearly rule out D. That means our answer here is going to be C. All right, everybody, topic 10, cross-text connections, is our next topic here. So question types, based on the text, the authors of both passages would most likely agree on which statement or how would the authors of text one respond to a claim from text two or, you know, text two to text one, etc. Okay, these are pretty simple. They're kind of like rhetorical synthesis in that you do have to do a lot of reading sometimes, but here are steps to solve those types of problems. So the first thing you're going to do, you want to skim passages. You don't necessarily need to read every word. Just make sure you get a general idea. Make sure you know which side of the argument both are on, which reasoning, what line of reasoning they have, etc. Then you're going to eliminate conflicting choices or choices that conflict with these lines of reasoning and these and their and their you know their point of views. Now remember that the correct answer, okay, the correct answer will extend the author's point of view. It will extend their ideology. What does that mean? Well, the in each text. There's going to be some sort of ideology that's stated, some sort of point, choice, view, opinion, whatever, right? And they're going to they're going to back that up with some sort of reasoning. But what your answer choice should do is your answer choice should should kind of continue their logic, continue their line of reasoning, right? It shouldn't conflict with it. It shouldn't do anything like that. Let's take a look and just read these, okay? I'm not going to read them word for word. I'm just going to skim them, give you a second here to skim them, maybe see if you can answer the question. Okay, so let's start off with answer choice A. By pointing out that Moore would assert that external world skepticism is at odds with other beliefs that these proponents must unavoidably hold. Okay, and this is how author 1 is responding to author 2. So author 2 is saying that external world skepticism is philosophical stance supposing that we cannot be sure of the existence of anything outside of our own minds. Okay, and G.E. Moore, who is the guy up here, is offering a proof refuting this stance, refuting this stance, <clears throat> okay, and I would say that this immediately is our answer, all right, why is this, because Moore is asserting, right, that to think about this, right, to even think about external world skepticism, you can't be sure of anything, so to be sure of something, or to be sure of anything, you need to have your basis, you need to be sure of something to be sure of anything, right, so I would say this is A, now this is pretty philosophical, right, we're getting kind of deep here, but by B, okay, so by arguing that it is valid, if it is valid to assert some facts are true based on instinct, it is also valid to assert that other proofs are inadequate based on instinct. Well, this isn't really what he's offering up, okay? There's not too much on instinct here. The main choice is definitely not on instinct, and this one doesn't even really mention instinct, right? 
So he's not going to respond to text 2 by talking about instinct when text 2 didn't even talk about instinct. Now, choice C, by agreeing, he's not going to agree. We can just take this out right here, but with agreeing that proponents that contradict his own is fun fundamentally unserious, okay, that's not how somebody's going to argue. They're not going to say, oh, you're silly, right? So this is, this is not the right answer. Now, our last choice here, by suggesting that an instinctive distaste for Morse position is preventing external world skeptics from constructing a sufficiently rigorous refutation of Moore. Now, she's calling an obviously annoying failure, right? And they haven't found out how to refute it exactly. But I would say that this is not the answer, right? Because although they are instinctively distasteful of it, right, external world skeptics aren't explicitly mentioned here, right? External world skeptics here are here, we don't know if she's necessarily specifically an external world skeptic because it just says many philosophers, right? And this is not what the what this argue, what this author is arguing here. Okay, this is a better answer. Maybe this could work if this if we didn't have A, but D is just simply not as good of an answer because of course he's going to go after the root of the issue. This goes after the root of the issue, and this basically just says, well, if you can't do it, if you can't refute me, then I'm right. Okay, they're going to try to give some more reasoning. They're going to back up their previous reasoning. They're not going to keep saying, you know, I'm right and, and you're not. That's not productive argument. So that's, that means that A would be our better choice here.